producing experiences for unique people. And because we're producing experiences for unique people, everything that we're doing is focused on being relevant to those people. And so what, what I produce for one group of people may be incredibly relevant to them and so relevant in that very moment that one of them says, you know, that was the best speech I've ever seen. But that does no, that in no way suggests that empirically that is the best speech that has ever been given. That same speech to a different audience that has different needs, that same speech may not be relevant to that group and they may go, huh, ah, okay. Mm, that's a good point. So, so when we talk about the concept of attention, I think about it, uh, I think about it from the perspective of relevancy. You know, I, if I could take the word marketing out of the dictionary, I would love to, and I'd love to replace it with the word relevancy. Can you explain that more? Well, people pay attention to you when you're relevant to them. True. Or if, well, I guess it's the same thing, or if they're scared of you. Now, if they're <laughs> scared of you, it's because you're relevant in that moment. You're dangerous, which makes you relevant. Right. So, so the relevancy is the key because if we think about, well, how do I get attention? Then, then the focus is egocentric. It's mm -hmm. when I get something. Right. But if we think about how can I be relevant, then it is focused on the people that we're trying to get the attention from. Right. And this is something, you know, look, I, I, I don't mean to embarrass you here, but this is something you do brilliantly, really extraordinary. Just the number of opportunities you create for your friends and your colleagues, the number of people that you introduce to each other, just those things alone uh, have probably put, oh, I don't know, millions of dollars in the pockets of other people. Right. And you don't ask for anything in return. You mm -mm. don't uh, ever come back and say, hey, you know, remember I did that favor for you. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right. So, so that's, that's what, you know, when I, th when I send out an email a newsletter or uh, put together a launch campaign for a new product, I'm always thinking about how can I be relevant in this very moment to the people that I am trying to serve? And that's it. And one of the things I love about that is having had the experience of being coached by you, but also watching you and Amy coach others. What's been fascinating about seeing you do that is I sat in a room with some of the best speakers in the world and you pulled people up onto the stage and the piece of advice that you might give for Brian might be really different to the piece of advice you give to Laura. Yeah. And, or it could be the same piece of advice, but they're doing it very, very differently. What you tell Brian to stop, you might tell Laura to accelerate. And so that was really fascinating to me as well because what I noticed about when you and Amy were coaching is you were so focused in the moment of what was most relevant to them, what piece of coaching would be powerful for them. So you can't templatize what it is that you and Amy do yeah. when it comes to the live coaching. And that was a really cool thing for me was watching you both and the way you spent that attention. Can you talk a little bit more about how you do that? Sure. So you asked about the heroic public speaking community. Yeah. It has developed over time and it, it really has a life of its own. And very often, Amy and I are given credit for the culture in the community. But, and of course, we appreciate that. <laughs> but I think that the credit really goes to the members of the community because they create the, the community in, in their own image. All we do is we mm -hmm. create some ground rules. We, we lay, we set up the environment so that people can feel safe so that they can be fully self-expressed. And there are very clear guidelines that people adhere to. And what we find is, is that that's, that's an important part of the development of the community. But the thing that keeps people together is the fact that they transform together. They mm -hmm. change together. Right. And to your point that, we look at every person as a unique individual. Each person is having their own unique transformation and not in competition with anyone else. But when somebody sees them have that transformation and they, 
they have other people witness their own transformation, you have now have a shared experience that bonds you for life. Right. Because when you transform with people, when you change, you are connected. Even if you have dramatically different interests, different um, backgrounds, you still have gone through something together. And so when we, when, when, when we train the speaker, when we work with the speaker, the last thing we would ever want, ever, is somebody looking at somebody that we worked with and saying, oh yeah, that's a <laughs> Michael Port and Amy Port speaker. Right. Because each individual is so unique that we are trying to amplify what is unique about that individual. And what we're doing fundamentally is teaching craft. At its most mm -hmm. basic level, we're teaching stagecraft. Right. And craft, when you master it, should be transparent. You shouldn't see the work. You shouldn't see the craft. And if they see the craft, then they might say, oh yeah, yeah, that's a Michael Port and Amy Port speaker. But if they don't see the craft and all they do is get the promise that that speaker is delivering, is offering, well then that speaker succeeded. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create that individual unique opportunity for transformation so that it's, it's, it's theirs. It's not ours, it's theirs and they own right. it. The other thing I've noticed that you do, though, is that for the audience who is watching someone be coached on stage, is that they're learning vicariously by the way that you are working with that individual. But those guidelines, those ground rules, those agreements that you set up with the audience is what allows that to happen. Mm -hmm. You teach your audience how to pay attention in the moment. Can you talk a little bit more about how you put some distinction around the performer versus the critic when it comes to attention? Yeah, sure. I think you can be a performer or you can be a critic, but I don't think you can be both. So I think if you are interested in being a performer, then I think we need to make a choice. And the choice is, am I going to see the world as a performer or am I going to see the world as a critic? Because there are two types of critics. There's the internal critic, there are those voices in your head that tell you right. you're not enough or you don't know enough. you never be good enough. And then there's the external critic, the people in the cheap seats <laughs> who like to push other people down to lift themselves up. Right. And often we hear those critics very loudly. We know a lot of our friends, they'll, they'll get 300 evaluations that are brilliant Mm -hmm. Oh my God, best speech I've ever seen. Loved her. She was phenomenal. Then one that says, I hate her. I hate everything about her. She's horrible. <laughs> and all we can do is obsess about that one. I'm laughing because I am her sometimes. We pay attention to that one negative comment. Correct. So we're paying attention to that person in the cheap seat who, for whatever reason, wants to push you down. That doesn't mean that you know, somebody doesn't have a piece of uh, feedback for you that is helpful, that can help make you improve. But we know the difference between those two things. They're generally yeah. pretty clear. Agree. So, so I don't actually remember what my original point was. Where, we were where talking was. about the guidelines you've established to get people ah, yes, to pay yes. attention, especially That's when they're not being coached. And so they don't jump into a critic mode is one of the guidelines I've loved that you've set up. That's right. So when we have people working together in a room, and let's say I have one person on stage and there's other people in the audience watching me coach that person on stage, and then I'm teaching the people in the audience uh, through vis-a-vis -vis that coaching, the, it, I, I do not allow anyone in the audience to give any feedback to that person who is being coached for a number of reasons. One, often it's a new experience for them and I'm throwing so much at them so quickly and asking so much more of them than they have even ever asked of themselves True. that it's hard when they hear too many voices, it gets confusing. Additionally, sometimes when somebody gives uh, another performer feedback, that feedback, although may, be, although it may be accurate, it may not be helpful in that moment mm. because I may be trying to take that speaker over here, but the other feedback takes them over here. Right. And although that's a worthwhile place to go, it's not what we need to do at the moment because the thing about art that's so interesting is that we know what we like and what we don't like. 
Correct. And we can tell people what we like and what we don't like. But we don't always know, A, why we like it or why we don't like it. (laughs) Yes. And B, we also don't always know how to help people do it in such a way that it's more effective. That's a particular uh, skill. That's a particular craft that one uh, uh, is either trained in or develops over time. And some people also have that more naturally uh, than others. So, so for those, for those two, two, two reasons and a third, which is you need to feel safe. Mm. And sometimes someone can give you feedback that, even though they think they're being helpful can hurt, can be hurtful that's because true. you're in a sensitive place when you're trying something that's different, that's creative. So even the, even the feedback sandwich, the here's, what's really great. Uh, let me tell you something that's not so great. <laughs> I will tell you something that's so great. Even that feedback sandwich can, can sometimes be given at the wrong time. So uh, the audience members may not know what, if that time is appropriate or not. So of course we want them to give feedback like, oh, it's so amazing to see this. It was great to see this. I was really moved by this, but not any um, coaching or certainly negative feedback. And in the book we talk about, in the attention book, we talk about getting feedback from people who are qualified to give it. So I believe in only seeking qualified feedback. So as a speaker, if I want to know how I was with the sound, I'm going to ask the AV team. If I want to know how I was as a client, I'm going to ask the meeting planner. And I think it goes back to your point about relevancy and that is being relevant and providing feedback, but also being qualified to give it. When people come to heroic public speaking, whether it's the live events you do, or maybe you're doing a video shoot for them or maybe you're doing rehearsals in New York but one of the things you've been very specific about is making it current and relevant in that moment and being able to make them feel protected when you think about this whole idea of the work you do Mm -hmm. what is the most important thing that you need to pay attention to in the work that you do well I think that depends it depends on what area of work we're looking at so You know, there's the work that we do on the business. Mm -hmm. There's the work that I do in the business. Right. So there's working with clients. Mm -hmm. There's working uh, with my staff. There's working uh, on myself to improve. Good point. And so there's so many different areas that need attention. I think the hardest thing is to feel like you have enough energy to place enough attention in all the different places that want attention because as you know the bigger game you play the more people want of you that's the whole point if you if somebody's reading this book because they want to go out and get more attention they better darn sure be uh, uh be clear about what they're asking for you know the the old be careful what you get what you wish for yes because if you get a lot of attention, it now means you are responsible for that attention if you've asked for it. Right. If you didn't ask for it, I don't want any attention and you're giving me this attention, that's not my problem. Mm-hmm. But if I said, I want you to read my book, I want you to come to this event, um, I want you to come and work with me, I want you, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now I have to honor, I have to honor that attention. So I think for me, I think it's identifying what, where I need to place attention in each of those different areas. And so I don't know what one thing would be, except if I was going, if I was going to give you one thing, I would say, I think a lot of the, the business problems that I've run into in, in the past and at present, and I know I'll run into them in the future, are, are probably personal problems in disguise. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, if there's an organizational issue in the business, it may stem from the way that I behave in the world. Mm-hmm. My business is a, is a representation of my personality, my mind. Sure. So if there's some sort of operational issue, well, I might want to look at myself first. How am I operating? If if you know we're bringing a lot of, if uh, let's say that um, let's say that lots of people are are coming and saying they want they want to 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 do the work, but then they're not committing to doing the work. Well, first thing I have to do is look at what am I doing mm-hmm. that may create that particular dynamic. 
Yeah, because you're role modeling it for them. Exactly. So I'm role modeling it. Is it that, you know, uh, is it that we're, we're really great at getting people excited, but, but then when push comes to shove, when they realize it's really hard, we haven't put enough structures in place to support them. You know, I'm just making these things up. They could sure. be a million different things. Yeah. So, so all of the potential areas that need attention, uh, if they're not getting attention, it's usually a result of some uh, deficiency in my personality. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I know I, it, it sounds like it's being highly critical or negative uh, of myself. but It's very self-aware. But I, there's a lot of things that I do not do well at all. And I know that, personality wise, I have to manage the way that my brain works. Mm -hmm. There's certain times a year where I have more trouble um, staying positive, staying, staying focused, staying engaged than other times of the year. Uh, and I found it, you know, I'm 46 years old. I found it, you know, over the years that there's a particular pattern uh, that uh, exists. And so what I need to do is I need to try to manage against that pattern that I have found uh, pops up. Uh, every single year. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think it's, it's being really, frankly, just gosh darn honest about who you are and what you're capable of. Right. Um, we're not all capable of all things in big and, ways. And that's right. And I think what you talk about, the book goes into more detail as leaders, that we have a responsibility to give attention to get attention. And in a world where attention has become a drug because of things like social media and the platforms that has made it so easy for people to get attention, that as leaders, we have to also look at where we're focusing our attention and we have to go inwards first. We have to look at how we show up as a leader and how that then has a ripple effect across the teams we manage, the clients we serve. And in your case, the world stage as you help some of these speakers, whether they're industry experts, whether they're running their own practice or whether they're standing on stages in front of tens of thousands of people, you have to give them the attention they need in that moment to make them even a better version of themselves. But they also have to pay attention to the advice that you're giving them in order for them to show up in the best way yeah. in the world as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that the, what, you, what you just said made me think of of the different roles that we play because in my role now i am not the one on stage the people That's i true. serve are the ones on stage yeah but you used to be the keynote speaker you used to be the actor right exactly so uh, so a lot of my time was focused on getting people to look at me right uh, and now my role is to blend into the background and and make sure that the spotlight is on the people that we serve. Sure. And so one of the things that we did to, to help with this, and this may seem like a small thing, but a lot of times the little things are what actually end up changing a culture, changing a, um, an environment. Amy, as you, of course you know, is strikingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a presence that's incredibly powerful. She walks in a room and everyone okay. knows she's in the room. She's not one of those big, boisterous personalities. She's actually um, uh, quite, I think, um, refined. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and historically, if I walk in a room, you usually know I'm in the room too. Right. So what we did when we moved away from being the performers and instead supporting the performers, she started wearing, we started, I, I don't wear white. I wear black and she started wearing black and white. Mm-hmm. Because I thought, well, the stagehands wear black because they don't want any attention. Mm -hmm. So you don't see them. And I felt if, if I was in black and my students were in color, then it's a, it's a, it's a demonstration of, of what's important to pay attention to on stage. It's a beautiful example. It seems like a small one, but it has... Very significant. Yeah. yeah, it's had profound effects in the business and it continues to remind me of what my role is. So I think it's interesting. It's so interesting. Your, your work is so interesting to me and the concept of attention is so fascinating. And I, I know that it must, it must just inspire so many heated conversations because people have all sorts of preconceived notions about what mm -hmm. that means. And, and some might have a negative association with, with that because they were always told, stop it. Don't, right. you're trying to get too much attention. Pay attention. Oh, yeah. Pay attention, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and nobody wants to be told, <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> so, so it's so interesting to me, but, but fascinating and so important as well. I think that if, if we're willing to, if we're willing to be really clear about where, what kind of attention we want to earn yes. and what we want other people around us to pay attention to, right. then we can play the right role for that situation. Correct. That's for exactly example, right. Well, for example, my, one of my um, good friends when I was in graduate school for acting is a guy named Daniel Day Kim. And Daniel Day Kim is uh, now on Hawaii Five-0 and he mm -hmm. was on- Yeah. Yeah, he was on Lost for many years and he's become- Right, very famous. Actor. He is, he's a very, very talented person in a number of different areas. Very, very bright. He got into law school uh, before he decided to become an actor. He was thinking about doing that. Uh, he plays musical instruments. He's a pretty incredible guy. Multi-talented. Multi-talented. And I remember when we'd have group discussions in grad school because we were an ensemble and there were 18 of us. He rarely spoke until the end of the meeting. But when he spoke, everybody listened. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that the folks that spoke the most at the beginning actually were less influential by the end. Yes. Because people started to get tired of hearing what they had to say. Right. Now, I, I have to continue to remind myself of that lesson because my natural inclination is to jump right in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I have to work against that and identify, well, what's my role in this situation? Is my role to be the one that is instigating and leading this? Or can I play a different role? Do I have to play the same role all the time? Right. If you play the same role in every situation, you might actually not get attention in a number of those different situations because you're playing the wrong role. Correct. Or you get the wrong kind of attention because you haven't stepped into the role that has been expected or required of you. Yeah, correct. I yeah. know that the people who are watching this video and the people who read about this in the book are going to want more information and they may want more information about how they can get involved in the heroic public speaking program. I know you have multi levels. I've had the privilege of seeing the live program being part of the graduate program. I work with you and Amy as my performance coaches. If people want to find out more about you and how they can access that community, where would they go? Heroic public speaking dot com. Heroic public speaking dot com. Easy. And we will include that in the notes. Thank you so much for being part of today. I've absolutely enjoyed interviewing you. I know we could talk for hours and hours. We may can need I to say one more thing? You can. Okay. When you are a performer, you can focus on, as I said before, well, you can focus on being a performer or being a critic. So if you decide to be a performer, then you have to decide what to focus on as a performer. And I think one of two things often happen. Either we focus on getting results or we focus on getting approval. Mm. Because a lot of people that want Correct attention, a lot of people that want attention are going after the approval. Correct. And when you go after approval, you know, you may get attention, but you generally don't produce the kind of results that you want. Now you could, you, you could parse the language here and say, yes, but if they're getting approval, then you're going to get them to say yes. And I don't, I'm not talking about that kind of approval. I'm talking about the kind of approval where you pander and, and don't, you know, tell the truth or you try to be somebody other than you are to get people to like you. Right. You say things that you may not really believe because, you know, you want people to approve of you. Or you say in speaking, you put together your presentations in such a way that you're, you're going for the approval rather than the results. And sometimes when you go for results, it's going to be provocative. Not everybody's going to love it. Sure. Um, and, uh, and it requires sometimes a little bit more courage. So if you decide to be a performer, then I would say place your attention on the results you want to achieve for the people in the room and for yourself, rather than the approval that you are trying to get from the people in the room. So results over approval. Powerfully said. What an awesome point to finish on. Thank you so much for being part of today. I so appreciate you. You're welcome.